we're gonna use the do it all dough. And by adding one ingredient to it, we're gonna turn it into focaccia. So do it all dough, link in the description. This is the all purpose dough that you can use to make pizza, ovals, sourdough rounds, sandwich bread, uh, dinner rolls, all kinds of stuff, non bread. Uh, but today we're gonna take the same dough that we always use to make all these different variations of sourdough and we're gonna add olive oil to it. And it's really just the olive oil and the shaping process that's gonna make this go from you know a beautiful rustic crusty loaf of sourdough to a tray bread, focaccia, which is gonna require a lot less shaping and mm, a lot less handling. It's a faster process. Uh, this is a great kind of same day bread. Uh, we're gonna start just like we always do. We've got starter, it's been activated, fed it the night before. Uh, in, in my environment right now, it takes about you know, 10 hours to look like this, uh, ready to go, ready to mix dough. We are using a 500 gram batch of dough. Now when I say 500 grams, I am purely talking about the flour weight. Of course the dough is gonna weigh more once we include the, the water, the salt, and the starter. But 500 grams is our flour batch, and this will fit perfectly on a quarter sheet tray. A uh, half sheet tray, you're gonna have to double up. This is just right for a, a quarter size sheet tray. Uh, recipes in the description, just so you, you know, have it in writing so you can see it and refer to it. Stainless steel mixing bowl, this is a five and a half quart bowl. We're going water, uh, measurements in the description. Water, starter, I'm using a dough whisk today. You can certainly use your hand. Uh, if you've got a KitchenAid mixer, that's an option too, but that's a different process. So I'm gonna say dough whisk or your hand. Now, starter, I'll use my whisk and just incorporate it into my water, make it a homogenous, uh, you know, creamy liquid. And then we're going flour, we're using bread flour. We want a high protein uh, gluten content, high gluten protein content, something in the neighborhood of like 12 and a half to 14%. We want that extra stability and structure from the gluten protein because we're adding olive oil, which is gonna make our dough feel a lot more slack than it would if there was no olive oil in it flour and then olive oil right so three tablespoons go into the dough and why am i not weighing it in grams well depending on how extra virgin your olive oil is it's going to weigh a different weight so i could tell you it's however many grams and you use a less viscous oil and it's not going to have the same effect so we're going volume measurement makes sense here uh, and then salt and i'm going salt in now i know the internet is going to say that i have to auto leaves my dough and my salt is gonna block out the absorption of water, but it's gonna be fine, it's gonna work. Trust me, this is good. Everything's in the bowl, right? We've got water, starter, flour, olive oil, and salt. And we're gonna mix it together and it's gonna become a sticky, rough, shaggy dough. And that's the word everybody uses to describe this, shaggy. And, you know, we mix it all together, uh, get the flour, the water, everything incorporated. It's gonna feel more sticky than normal. This is a 75% hydration dough. So what does that mean? That means that my water is 75% of my flour. So my flour is 500 grams, my water is 375. Now normally 75% hydration dough for me feels pretty easy to handle. Uh, it's gonna feel more like a 85% hydration dough now, or 80% from the olive oil. It's gonna give it a very different tactile feel. It's gonna make it more sticky. I recommend using whatever hydration level you're comfortable with. And then, you know, maybe it's 65%, maybe it's 70%. Keep that and then go olive oil. You're going to have an easier time adjusting to how sticky this is versus upping your hydration level to one that you're not used to and adding olive oil. Uh, it's going to be harder to handle. You might be sorry if you do it this that way. So maybe stick with the hydration level you're used to for making sourdough ovals or rounds or sandwich bread. That's my, my recommendation. Um, bowl, scrape down, cover. Uh, I actually, with a small batch like this, like a 500 gram batch, I prefer to keep it in Tupperware. I believe this is a 96 ounce, 96 ounce Tupperware, 48 ounce, 48. I think it's a 48 ounce Tupperware. I'll link description. Um, but this is going to allow my dough to double in volume. And I know once it gets kind of to the top, like I'm, I'm kind of good when I get to bulk fermentation. So it serves as like a nice measuring tool. That's why I like these containers. Anyway, we're going through a regular process of stretch and folds. So 30 to 45 minutes after mixing, we're gonna get our first stretch. And if you're familiar with this channel, you know I normally stretch my dough in midair. 
And if this were like a regular hydration dough, my first stretch, it would come out of the container and we would tuck, tuck, fold, fold, and work our way around. Not today, not for this. Um, this first stretch is gonna be really sticky. So I'm going to actually do what you might see on a lot of other YouTube channels where like you pick up a corner out of the container and you fold it to the middle. And you turn the container and you pick up a corner and you fold it to the middle. And you can see it's pretty slack, it's pretty loose. And I'm just working my way around here. Uh, just from every side. Pick up the dough, kind of stretch it out. We're trying to agitate some of those gluten proteins to get them to become elastic. And just work my way around until it starts to form a little bit more of a structure and there's less that I can kind of pull on. And when it starts to like become sort of a ball in the container, we're good. And what have I got here? Maybe 10, 10 pulls, you know, pulling the, the sides up and then folding it back onto itself. Uh, you know, still get your hands kind of wet. It's going to be pretty tacky. Get them wet enough that uh, it's not going to stick to you, but it's still going to stick to itself. And you can see here, I've kind of dipped my hands uh, a couple times just to protect myself from getting dough all over me. So lid on the container, 30 to 45 minutes later, here it goes, number two. Uh, I'm going to be pretty generous with getting my hands wet here because it is going to come out of the container and I am going to stretch it like I normally do. Um, the first here, first time here, hands wet, I'm just kind of releasing it from the sides and then hands a little bit more wet because this is a pretty tacky dough and out of the container it comes. Real long and elastic and I'm just taking one side, folding the other side under and I'm bringing you know, sides to the middle, tucking, folding, establishing tension, agitating those gluten proteins to you know, build elasticity in our dough. Pretty simple process, uh, lid back on 30 to 45 minutes later and I usually with the, with the focaccia dough, I'm leaning more towards the, the 40 to 45 minute window of time. I just feel like it needs a little bit more time to settle. Uh, if I were in doing this in the winter time, I might be able to get away with a shorter rest period between stretches, but it's 100 degrees right now. It's hot, it's, and it's about 80 degrees in my kitchen. So, you know, you might need to make some adjustments based on your environment. I'm actually using much cooler water to get away with making dough right now because my environment says so. If I use warm water, it's just not going to work out for me. That's the you know, nuance and art of, of sourdough baking. Anyway, third stretch, it's the same, you know, wet hands, you know, release it, pull it out, and we're tucking and folding and establishing tension and surface tension, getting the dough to pull on itself. Goes back in the container. We get a fourth one 30 to 45 minutes later. And, you know, same thing. You can see when it comes out of the container now, it's got a lot more uh, structural kind of stability to it. It's not as loose and sloppy, and you can see it doesn't really, you know, it's not really sticking to my hands as much. Forms into a ball a lot faster. And now bulk fermentation, which is just the process of letting the dough double in size. That's it. That's what it's doing. It's doubling in size. And once it gets to uh, going from, you know, small ball in the container with corners and space available and then it fills the container like just to the lid I know I'm good to go and shaping shaping is different here and it's kind of easy but it's also kind of hard no it's not hard it's just kind of messy so if you got like a weird thing about getting your hands dirty maybe this isn't the project for you shaping is interesting because we're going to shape it into kind of a flat rectangle so it fits on our uh, quarter sheet tray and you can see here what am I doing with the paper I'm kind of measuring uh, the in interior dimensions of the of the quarter sheet tray by folding the edges down and I'm creating a template on my parchment paper uh, I like this brand it's paper chef it's great super reliable I get it in a two-pack at Costco uh, around the holidays it goes on sale because people are making pies and stuff so stock up on it when you can it's not affordable on Amazon so I folded like a template on there so I can see where the inside of the tray is and I'm gonna you know Take my dough, I'm gonna oil the top of it. And how much oil is going on here? We're going uh, just one tablespoon. And we're gonna spread it over the top and you can see my hands kind of go into the sides. I'm trying to get the olive oil to go all the way around the dough. We're coating the dough in the container um, just so it's, it's got some good lubrication on it. There's no flour here, there's no water. Uh, it's going to go right onto my work surface from here. And one of the other things I like about these little containers is its shape. So once I, I remove it, and I'm trying to remove it in a rectangle, because what shape am I trying to get it on? I'm trying to get it on a rectangle, rectangular quarter sheet tray. Don't rip it out, is what I'm trying to say. Don't rip it out of the container, and then you get this weird, wrecked, uh, massive dough. That's, that's not going to cooperate with you in what we're doing here. So try and take it out of the container in one shape. Now, if you're coming out of a bowl, you don't have these containers, buy them, they're cheap. 
Um, but if you're coming out of a bowl, you know, try and maintain the round shape of a bowl versus ripping it out. Like we don't want to rip it out of the container like we did when we were stretching and folding. Uh, you're going to make things way harder if you do that. So now I've taken it out and I've got, you know, lots of lubrication on it. It's not going to stick to me. It's not going to stick to my work surface. And I'm going to pull it out into close to the size of um, my paper that's that's kind of folded. You know, I've got my, my, uh, my template on there. And then from here, you know, I, I came out of the container presentation side down. And I'm going to flip it back over because there's like a smooth side that was face up in the container. And then there's kind of the uglier side that's down. So I want to put the ugly side back down. Even though we're going to dimple this, it's just how my brain wants to do it. Um, and then parchment paper is right next to my work surface. I'm going to pick up my dough and I'm going to put it onto the parchment paper. And that's it. Like we're kind of good to go. We're, it's, you know, in a similar size as the folded lines of the rectangle that we've established on the tray on the paper and we're just going to slide it onto the tray look at this this is so easy there's like no shaping and then from here uh, the dough is really not going to stick too much to the paper because it's so well lubricated but we're going to pull it out uh, trying to maintain like a consistent thickness here and we want it's going to retract a little bit it's going to pull back so you know you want to encourage it to be uh, full completely filling the tray to all the edges, you know, try and avoid having those gaps in the corners. Just work with it. You can tap it. Uh, you can kind of push from the middle as if you were, you know, kind of getting some pizza dough work in uh, and just encourage it to be the shape of the tray. Now what happens? Well, now we have kind of a final proofing and I just put it in, uh, I have a double oven. I put it in my lower oven. It's off. There's a sign that says, don't turn on the oven. And it's going to go from looking like this after it's in the tray and uh, what was it on this day? Everybody's environment's gonna be different. Uh, these guys took about two and a half hours to kind of come up to the edge of the tray. And if you look in the before, so this is when they f I first put them into their trays, uh, you can see there's like maybe a, a half inch, three quarters of an inch of, of edge in the inside of the tray. And then after they're to the level, to the surface of the rim of the tray, we're good to go. We need to dimple these guys, oil them up and bake them. Now, if I started this at, you know, 7 a.m. mixing my dough, and I went through about a, you know, two hours and 15 minutes or something like that of stretches and folds, and then we had, you know, maybe, uh, you know, two two to four hours of bulk fermentation, and then you know, two hours of final proofing, we should be coming up close to dinner time. This is going to be like perfect. We're timing this right on time, so it's going to be ready for dinner. So, it's risen. It's you know, doubled in volume or, or something. And now we're going to oil it. I know so much olive oil, right? We've got three tablespoons in the dough. We had a tablespoon to get it out of our container. And now we're going two more and, you know, use a nice extra virgin olive oil for all of this. The olive oil that's in the dough is going to give you like a real smooth, silky, soft interior texture. It's going to be great. And then all this, you know, olive oil on the top is going to give us that really nice, thin, crisp crust. And, you know, all the bubbling and cool stuff, it's going to help hold the dough from expanding too much. Dimpling. That's what it's called. That's what we're doing. So I've got two tablespoons of olive oil on the surface of the dough. And you're going to just use your hands. You can take a hand and just kind of take what you've you know, spread on the surface of the dough. Take your hands, kind of, you know, pat it around and spread that oil over the surface. And then we're going to take your fingers, one, two, three, all of them, whatever. And we're trying to connect the top surface of the dough to the bottom of the dough. And, you know, there, you can see there's air bubbles and I'm going to pop a lot of them. I'm not worried about it because they will reinflate. Many of them will and some new ones will be created. Don't, don't feel bad. If you leave some of them, they'll just be ridiculous giant blisters. And if you want to go for that, cool. But the thing that we want to avoid is being too gentle with the dimpling. We want to be pretty aggressive. We want to stick that top surface to the bottom because if you don't, your whole bread is going to expand like a regular loaf. It's going to spring. And we don't want it to spring. We want it to have amazing bubbles and pockets that are, you know, you know, full of that wonderful extra virgin olive oil and, you know, like a really nice, uh, shiny, golden brown, uh, you know, essentially crust on the top. This is not going to be a thick crust. I promise you that. Uh, because it has not been, you know, cold proofed and, and, you know, dried out in the fridge in a basket like a, a round or an oval. It should be a pretty thin crust. Now, dimple the heck out of it all over the place. I like this salt, this sea salt, um, to, to just give it just that extra pop of saltiness in the crust. And, you know, the big flakes have like a nice bite to them, kind of a nice pop. Uh, 
actually got this jar of salt at Costco. They just happen to have it on sale. So it doesn't have to be a specialty purchase through Amazon or something else. Uh, just keep an eye out. And you're in charge, you know, whatever you feel like is the right amount of salt for you and your family. Uh, I would call this like medium generous, what I've got on here. And my oven is preheated uh, to 425. We're going in the oven, middle of the oven, and I'm also baking on top of a cast iron lodge pizza stone. Why? Now, if you do your internet research, you will see a lot of people will put their focaccia into a glass Pyrex dish. I don't like that. Maybe it's because I, you know, spent so many years in the restaurant, we always made focaccia in sheet tray, so it's what I know and it makes sense to me. But even in a sheet tray, and this is the problem with the Pyrex, we're not going to get very good color on the bottom of the tray, on the bottom of the bread. And that's, you're really going to see that with the, the glass. Like, it's just not going to conduct the heat, so you get, like, any real coloring. It's going to be real blonde. It's going to be missing some flavor. How do we solve that? With a cast iron pizza stone. Uh... It's in the oven, it got preheated with my oven, so it's gonna, you know, the tray's gonna go on that and it's gonna give me extra heat into the bottom of the tray so we get a little bit of color on the bottom of our focaccia, which is nice. It's not gonna be dark brown, but it's gonna be less blonde if we didn't, if we hadn't done that. Now, I'm using an oven that has a heating element in the back. So if you're using a heat, an oven that has a heating element from the bottom, maybe you're gonna get plenty of color on the bottom of your focaccia. Now, you will have to experiment with that, but I would probably start with, you know, in the middle of the oven on the pizza stone. A cast iron one, not one of those chintzy ceramic ones. Those don't conduct heat. They're terrible. Throw it away. Just donate that thing. Put it in Goodwill. 15 minutes. It's baking for 15 minutes. We're going to turn it 180 degrees. And you can see it here. Beautiful. We've got great blistering. It's got a little bit of rise to it, uh, but nothing too crazy. And we're going to set the timer for another 15, and then... We will take it out, and here it is. Here it comes. Uh, coming out of the oven, looks amazing, it's beautiful. The house smells ridiculous. There's something, a different smell when, when you're baking dough that has the olive oil in it. Just a different, different aromatic to it. And we're gonna let it cool on a wire rack in the tray. We don't need to take it out, it's fine. For at least an hour and a half, uh, two's better. And then to serve it, after it's cooled, I like to slice it. So I'm gonna go out of the tray onto a cutting board, take it out of the paper, and we're gonna slice it into slices uh, that we would serve at the table. Let's see, is it too windy for my microphone? I've got the windscreen on it. I don't know, we'll find out when I edit this. Okay, so it's sliced and now I wanna serve it, but I wanna reheat it. I want I wanna go back in the oven and I wanna get the, the crust on the surface just a little bit crisper. I want it to have a little bit of a snap to it uh, and I wanna warm the bread through. I want you know people to grab a piece off the tray and it's got that amazing salty bite to it when you get a flake of salt on there and the surface of the dough is just a little bit crisp and it's nice and warm and silky, uh, full of air kind of interior crumb. So that's what we're going for here. And you can see here, you know, the end product, it got a little bit more color after toasting it, which is fine. And you can take that into consideration on the initial baking phase. Like, is this gonna get reheated? Or am I trying to land this on the table now? And it's it's really your preference. Like, how dark do you want it? It's up to you. Uh, this, this, I think, is just kind of right on the money. Kind of nice middle ground, golden brown, delicious GBD. And you know, however you want to land on the table, I just go with the sheet tray on the table. This is a really simple thing, uh, very, very beginner friendly in the sense that it's a same day bread and there's no shaping, there's no cold proofing, there's no cast iron pot, uh, very basic. So put this one into play. This is a really easy one to do. It's a tray bread. Um, and it, you know, I, I'm really tempted to say this, that this is a great beginner bread, but it does require like a little bit more perseverance through the stickiness of stretching and then the willingness to, you know, handle, handle a bigger piece of dough as you're shaping it onto a sheet tray. And I think the olive oil makes a really big difference. Get like a decent extra virgin olive oil because you're going to taste it. It's going to add flavor and dimension to your, to your bread. Uh, because think about it, we just use six tablespoons of olive oil to make this bread. That's a lot of olive oil. Uh, so it's going to be apparent there's going to be a flavor. So use a good one.